Father, to the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, you are the true bread that comes down from heaven to satiate our longing for your revelation and intimacy. May this gift of yourself continue to satiate us on our earthly pilgrimage to make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our current cases today, we are reflecting on Jesus the bread of life. John chapter 6, verses 24 to 35. Jesus is the gift from God that gives life. He is the bread that comes from heaven, broken and distributed for the life of the world. He is the bread that is broken and yet never divide. He is the bread that is eaten and yet never exhausted. He is the bread that is consecrated and consecrates those who believe and partake of him. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us contextualize the peric of our catechesis. Our text, John chapter 6, verses 24 to 35, provides the context for review and deconstruction of the miracle of the multiplication of the five loaves and two fish. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. The sign of the multiplication of five loaves and two fish was not about filling up the tummies with food, but it was about who Jesus is. The true bread of God that comes down from heaven. It is Jesus who is broken and distributed for the life of the world. And this is the bread Jesus is asking the crowd to work for. Not in the sense of human endeavor, but in the sense of striving after yearning and believing. It means dedicating oneself in the same measure as in rabbinic tradition of devoting oneself or working on the Torah as food that endures. By inviting the crowd to believe in him, Jesus provides an achievable goal to the difficult task of law keeping. They must do only one thing. Believe in the one whom God has sent. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us now revert to a Bible text for further reflections. The text reads in part, When the multitude saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they got into the boats, and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him, they asked, Rabbi, when did you come here? John chapter 6, verses 24 and 25. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the crowd means to ask only about how Jesus transported himself to Capernaum. Already, in John chapter 6, verses 22 to 23, the crowd had noticed that there was only one boat and that Jesus had not gotten into it. So they seemed to be interested on how Jesus got there. Of course, Jesus got to the other side of the sea by walking on water. A miracle that bespeaks of his identity as the Son of God. Nonetheless, Jesus ignores their question and rebukes them for their superficial interest. He says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because 
you ate the loaves and were filled. John chapter 6, verse 26. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we note that in the hierarchy of needs, the crowd is focused on the stomach level rather than the spiritual level. At the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus satiated their physical hunger and now they are looking for more food. The meeting of physical needs such as food, clothing, shelter, money, etc. never lose its appeal. Spiritual gifts, however, are a different story. They tend not to steer the same excitement as a new car or a promotion on the job. However, when life thrashes us and it drives us to our knees, that's when we come to our senses about what is really important in life. Faith in God. Material things are all vanity as Ecclesiastes says. And Jesus cautioned the crowds, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. John chapter 6, verse 27. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus challenged the crowds to raise their eyes, to see beyond the physical needs. Jesus is, however, not saying that physical needs are not important, but that we must prioritize. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All other things will be given as well. These words establish an order of priorities for human action, for how we approach everyday life. First and foremost is the primacy of God, that spiritual good. And Jesus calls the crowd to acknowledge their need for food that endures for eternal life. And Jesus promises them that the Son of Man will give them that food, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Apropos, a seal authenticates authorship or ownership. A seal gives official status, just as a signature or password would do today. Therefore, the bearer of a seal will be accorded the respect due to the person who sealed it. God the Father has set his seal on the Son, who acts on his behalf as his emissary from heaven to earth. However, the crowds responded, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Here the crowd is thinking in terms of the Torah, which they need to obey and observe. Ever since God gave them the Torah at Mount Sinai, the Jews recognized obedience to the law as their approved way of serving God. However, the Torah law is complex, and this crowd is asking Jesus, to point them to the heart of the law. In much the same way the young ruler will ask, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Luke chapter 18, verse 18. The question of the crowds, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, refers to the critical works of the Torah that need to be observed to fulfill the works. Jesus answers and says to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. 
John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus does not refer them to the law, but rather to himself as the work. He moves them from the works of the law to the work of faith in himself. By inviting them to believe in him, Jesus provides an achievable alternative to the difficult task of observing the various laws which were more than 600 to be kept. They must do only one thing. Believe in the one whom God has sent. And St. Paul puts it so succinct. A man is justified by faith and not the law. Romans chapter 3 verse 28. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, but they said, what sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. John chapter 6, verses 30 and 31. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, signs have been part of human life from the very beginning. God has employed signs of various kinds, symbols and miracles that point beyond to something greater, namely himself. The unleavened bread of the Passover is a sign to remind Israel of the salvation that God afforded them in Egypt. The exodus from Egypt and its accompanying miracles saved as the greatest sign of all. And God expected the people of Israel to respond to signs and wonders by believing in him. These miracles did not only save the people of Israel, but also authenticated God's love and special provision for Israel. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the crowd recognized the radical nature of Jesus' invitation and demands assurance that he has authority to advocate such a sweeping departure from their traditional religious practices. They want a sign to authenticate him as God's prophet. For 12 centuries, they have observed the Torah, the Mosaic law, God-given law, as the way to please God and to assure their own salvation. For centuries, their rabbis have devoted their best efforts to applying the law to every situation. Throughout Israel's history, God has called Israel again and again to faithful observance of the law and has called prophets to help them to understand it. Now, Jesus is suggesting that they abandon their long-held allegiance to the law and stick their lives on him. Hence, they ask him to authenticate his authority in some unmistakable, compelling way. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the crowd seems, however, to have lost sight of the fact that Jesus had just authenticated his divinity by feeding 5,000 and more people with a boy's lunch. Yet, they asked for a sign and decided the manner as the kind of sign that they expected. They caught scripture, but inaccurate. He gave them bread from heaven to eat which is a combination of several scriptures, namely Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 15, Psalms chapter 78, verse 24, as well as Psalms 105, verse 40. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 
Moses' gift of manna authenticated his status as a prophet. If Jesus expects this crowd to accept him as a Moses-like prophet, he must give them a Moses-like sign. They have seen false prophets come and go. And they want a rock solid proof that Jesus is not one of them. Their demand represents the response of ordinary people faced with a new situation. Jesus had just thrown them off center. They are struggle to regain their balance. So they established the criterion that Jesus must meet if they are to believe and establish themselves as judge and jury. If Jesus will give them a sign, then they will be able to decide whether to believe in him or not. Their vision seems astonishingly myopic Given that Jesus just fed 5,000 or perhaps 10 or 20,000, including women and children, with a few loaves and two fish. But Jesus' miracle diminishes when compared to Moses' miracle. Jesus fed a few thousand people on one occasion, but Moses fed the whole nation every day for 40 years. Jesus gave the crowd ordinary bread, but Moses gave Israel bread from heaven. The crowd has seen Jesus perform a miracle, but now they raise the bar to demand that he matches Moses' miracle. However, Jesus says, Amen, Amen. I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. John chapter 6, verses 32 and 33. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus makes several remarks here to enlighten them. It was God, not Moses, who gave the manna. As a matter of fact, the manna was not the true bread from heaven, but the Father gives the true bread. Further, it is not that the Father gave, but that the Father gives. It is no longer in the past, but in the present. And Jesus, the bread of life, that has come down from heaven. Therefore, the true giver is God the Father. And this gift is not in the past, but in the present, here and now. The true bread was not the manna, but the bread of God in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ. The bread of God is the incarnate Son of God, the Emmanuel, God with us, who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And the prologue articulates it so well that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh, and dwelt amongst us. We saw his glory, such glory as of one and the only Son of the Father, full of grace and the truth. Confer John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, manna sustained the physical life of the people of Israel in the days. But temporary, as all of them subsequently died. However, the bread of God, Jesus Christ, gives eternal life. And the scope of life giving is broad and all embracing of humanity. So, they say to him, Sir, 
give us this bread always. Just say to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. John chapter 6, verse 3, 34 and 35. Like the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, the people of Israel or the crowds respond with a request that indicates their lack of understanding. Just as the Samaritan woman thought that Jesus had been speaking to her about physical water and thirst, so to the crowds respond as though Jesus had been offering physical bread that will forever fill their bellies. In a sense, the crowd say the right words. Lord, give us this bread always. But with the wrong understanding. To have properly understood Jesus' words would have prompted faith, not a fixation on bread. They have wrongly associated Jesus with Moses. Rather than associating Jesus with the bread from heaven, God the Incarnate. Jesus makes one more attempt to clear their understanding. I am the bread of life. In the discussion with Nicodemus earlier on, Jesus pointed to a birth beyond birth. In a conversation with a woman at the well, Jesus pointed to water beyond water. Now, Jesus points to bread beyond bread, the bread of God, which not only comes to the world through Jesus, but is Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, he who comes to me will not be hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Incidentally, in their 40 year trek through the wilderness, God fed the Israelites on manna, teaching them to rely on God for their sustenance. The deeper lesson was that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And now, Jesus makes a similar claim he will provide for the deepest needs of those who believe in him because he is the bread of God that comes into the world. Salient points for further reflections. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are invited to a soul searching and introspection of our lives. As Jesus points beyond to what meets the eye, Bread beyond bread. He calls for attention beyond what we see and feel, namely the spiritual. And that is the more reason we cannot only rely on physical bread alone, but by every way that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus Christ, the bread of God, that satiates our longings. But the other answer in Christ. In a heart that is touched and transformed by the vital power of the bread that comes from heaven, everything is subordinated to God and God becomes all in all. We come to appreciate ourselves as well as others as persons created in the image and likeness of God. We start seeing one another as brothers and sisters, rather than as obstacles or competitors or challenges to overcome. Further, when we are transformed by the bread that comes from heaven, we begin to trust in the silence of prayer rather than the ways of argument. The more we receive him, the bread that comes from heaven, the more we come to choose love and forgiveness 
rather than anger and retribution. We even begin to relate with intimacy and vulnerability rather than superficiality and defensiveness. The more we remain in him and feeding on him, Christ the bread of life, we tend to spend more time listening to his voice rather than to our voice. And in times of meditation, reflection, and introspection become longer than usual. And ultimately, we seek and long to nature life rather than death. We also come to discover that Christ is the bread that is broken and distributed for the life of the world. He is the bread that is broken, yet never divided. He is the bread that is eaten and yet never exhausted. He is the bread that is consecrated and consecrates those who believe and partake of him. Let us pray. God our Father, the gift of yourself extends to all. May we choose to be nourished and sustained by yourself, the bread of life. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this day, oh